Hi there, I'm glad to welcome you to my channel, World of Stories. I have a lot of interesting life stories that I want to share with you. Enjoy listening. Dorothy, it will Dorothy didn't close her eyes all night, and only towards morning did she sink into an anxious sleep. She had nightmares in which Stephen was the main character. Or rather, in her nocturnal visions, he was the victim of monstrous creatures. Dorothy tried to save her husband, but she couldn't succeed because the formidable monsters always took him away, but they didn't harm her. Opening her eyes, the woman anxiously looked at her sleeping little son next to her. Travis had been waiting for his dad to come yesterday, with whom he loved to play. A faint voice came from the adjacent room. Dorothy, are you awake yet? The woman lovingly covered her son with a blanket and hurriedly responded to the call of her sick mother-in-law. Mrs. Green, would you like something to drink? You should have woken me up earlier. I've already been a burden to you. You've exhausted yourself taking care of me, look, you're all pale green. Don't talk nonsense. Not all the problems are because of you. Besides, you're doing great, you're getting better. The elderly woman sighed heavily. I know it's all because of Stephen. Even though he's my son, if it were up to me, I don't know what I would do with him. He has ruined your life, and you're such a sweet girl who deserves happiness. Dorothy tried to hold back her tears because her mother-in-law's words evoked pity in her. Pity for herself and for this kind woman who, because of her son's fault, found herself in a helpless position. As if reading her thoughts, her mother-in-law immediately began to defend her son. Dorothy, but Stephen wasn't always like this. I gave birth to him when I was 42. My husband and I had already given up on the idea of having a child, and we had abandoned all the futile attempts when suddenly, a miracle happened. The mother-in-law spoke with difficulty, and some sounds were impossible for her to produce. But Dorothy had learned to understand her garbled speech, and now she looked at the elderly woman with astonishment. After all, she was sharing her most intimate secrets with her daughter-in-law for the first time. She encouraged the sick woman. Please, go on. I'm very interested in hearing your family history. We won't get any words from Stephen. Mrs. Green's face turned pink, and she smiled. He doesn't really know anything. And he hardly remembers his father. My husband was ten years older than me and already dreamed of a carefree old age. He wanted to buy a little house somewhere in a quiet place by a small river. For the sake of that cherished dream, my Lester gave up on a car he had been saving for for about ten years. We found a suitable house, but then the irreparable happened. For the first time in all this time, the mother-in-law allowed herself such candid speech. Dorothy didn't rush her, even though these unknown pages from this brave woman's life intrigued her. The daughter-in-law handed a glass of water to her mother-in-law, who took a few sips and continued. There have always been envious people, and my Lester had ill-wishers who didn't like his demanding nature. You see, my husband was a manager in a construction company, so he didn't tolerate laziness and carelessness from those who were slacking off. I never had a habit of interfering in my husband's affairs, thinking that Lester was doing the right thing, so it was a shock for me when someone knocked on our door late at night. Oh, Dorothy, I thought I wouldn't survive that disgrace. Mrs. Green, you mustn't worry. Maybe it's not worth remembering unpleasant moments? No. No, my dear, I want to tell you everything, there's no one else. I have a bad feeling about this. Don't get upset over trivial things. Remember what the doctor said, rest and positive emotions. If things go well, you'll soon recover. The mother-in-law looked at her daughter-in-law strangely. I hope God hears you. But it's better if I finish my story. Someone among the offended ones reported to the authorities that my husband had embezzled government funds and bought a country house with them. Officials from the relevant agencies came to our house. They turned everything upside down, but to this day, I don't know what they were looking for. Stephen was very young at the time and hindered the search of the house. One of them managed to kick the child, and Stephen started crying. Lester couldn't take it and rushed to fight the scoundrel. Before I could blink, the three of them pounced on the elderly man. After all, my husband was already in his sixties. Dorothy felt uneasy. 
Did they actually beat him in front of you? No, they didn't beat him in front of me. They just handcuffed him and threw him out of the apartment. My husband asked them to let him say goodbye to his son and wife, but they didn't listen. And in the morning, I was informed that Lester had died. They called on the phone, apparently couldn't bring themselves to come home. They said his heart couldn't handle it. My husband died right there during the interrogation. An ambulance was called, but the doctors couldn't do anything, he had a massive heart attack. The story exhausted the woman, and she closed her eyes, her chest heaving heavily from difficulty breathing. Dorothy was shocked by this story, but she really wanted to hear its ending. Mrs. Green. What happened to that house? Nothing. The anonymous accusation against my husband turned out to be false. They checked all the documents, not a shred of evidence. But you can't bring a person back. They didn't even consider it necessary to apologize to me, they didn't even help bury the person who died because of them. And back then, you know what difficult times those were. That's when Stephen and I were hiding around the city. Yes, you had it rough, no one would envy you. Dorothy was about to go to the kitchen to prepare breakfast, but her mother-in-law grabbed her hand. Stephen used to be good. It's recently that he's changed, influenced by his friends. He was an excellent student at my school, then he immediately went to art school, dreaming of opening his own gallery, but he dropped out after a year and transferred to another institute to study architecture. He said he wanted to continue his father's work. He was expelled after two years for excessive absences. I don't know when I missed my son. I gave him everything, worked two jobs, and even did translations at night. Maybe that was the mistake? Mrs. Green closed her eyes again. I've been thinking the same thing now. I shouldn't have turned my son into an idol. The older he got, the more he demanded. The last thing I gave him was his health. For a few minutes, the woman fell silent and then whispered, I can't even remember the last time I talked for so long. I'm very tired. Rest, and I'll take care of breakfast. In the small room, a suspicious noise could be heard. It seems Travis has woken up. He'll turn everything upside down in there. The mother-in-law squeezed the young woman's hand lightly. I'm so happy I waited for my grandson. Travis is a true miracle. To give the grandmother a chance to rest, Dorothy took her son with her. The kitchen was spacious enough, and the little boy had his own corner for playing. Travis was growing up as a calm child and always found activities for himself. He spoke very little, limited to single words or simple phrases. While Dorothy was cooking, the little one played enthusiastically, mumbling something indistinct. The mother looked at the child with affection. When will you start talking? At your age, it's the mother's job to bombard you with various questions. The child interpreted this address in his own way. He took his favorite toy car and handed it to his mother. Here, Mama, Tata. Dorothy laughed. You've got it mixed up, honey. Tata is what a train says. Where's our train? The little one ran to his improvised play area and pulled out a toy train from the pile of colorful toys. Mama, here. Thank you, sweetie, you're so clever. The praise gave strength to the one-and-a-half-year-old child, and he started spinning in place. Dorothy picked him up in her arms. You understand everything, but you're just lazy to speak. Something sizzled on the stove. Travis, you distracted mommy, and we almost spilled the milk soup on the stove. It will cool down a bit, and then we'll eat. Let's go wake up grandma. The boy ran out of the kitchen with excitement. Dorothy could already hear him offering his toys to his grandmother. Grandma, Tada. Good job, grandson. I would love to ride on your train, but my illness won't allow it. Dorothy was surprised by her mother-in-law's unusual behavior, she had never seen her so animated before. It so happened that she became her mother-in-law's caregiver willingly. Over six years ago, the woman had a stroke that left her disabled. She couldn't speak before, only grunting, and she couldn't move either. So Dorothy had to turn her over every day to prevent bed sores. Stephen rarely helped her. Once he confessed. 
Dorothy, understand, just the smell makes me nauseous. You're a nurse, you're used to all this. She couldn't recover from this revelation for a long time, but she still tried to reach her husband's consciousness. Stephen, this is your mother. I'm nobody to Mrs. Green. The man, whether joking or possibly serious, said. Maybe I'm a cynic, but you live in an apartment in a big city, enjoying the benefits of civilization, and comfort comes at a price. So you think that taking care of your mother is like a job duty? Are you serious? Quite so. Stephen, what do you take me for? The man realized he had gone too far and started apologizing to his wife. Dorothy was in the last month of her pregnancy at the time and took offense at any trivial matter. Dorothy, forgive the rascal. It's high time you got used to my jokes. You have strange jokes. Dorothy remembers how Stephen then got down on all fours and imitated a faithful dog. He was a master of parody and always used this technique to surprise or puzzle others. His stylized barking with howling made the expectant mother laugh, and the unpleasant incident was quickly forgotten. Although family life didn't spoil Dorothy with joy, there were still some pleasant moments to remember. She thought about this while pouring milk soup into bowls. Mrs. Green was having a conversation with her grandson in an unfamiliar language, but she perked up when she saw her daughter-in-law with a tray. Travis, we'll continue playing later, but now let's taste mommy's soup. I've got an appetite today, I wonder why. Dorothy placed a bowl on a special table for the invalid. That's a good sign, Mrs. Green. It means things are improving. I really want to believe you, but the women used to say when I was in the hospital that this happens before death. Stop even thinking about that. I don't like your mood today. All right, I'll be quiet. Mrs. Green ate with appetite and thanked her daughter-in-law. Dorothy, thank you, everything was delicious. Can I ask you for one favor? Of course, you didn't even have to ask. Call Stephen, something's troubling me. Dorothy fed Travis with a spoon. Taking advantage of his mother's momentary distraction, the little one reached into the bowl, and soon there was a mess of noodles on his face and clothes. The woman reacted, but it was already too late. Travis, what have you done? Now I have to clean up the room too. Turning to her mother-in-law, she responded calmly. I called him several times yesterday and this morning, but his phone is turned off. I'll try calling again later. Dorothy started cleaning, but she hadn't even finished washing the dishes when the doorbell rang insistently. It's probably our lost soul returning. The woman went to the hallway, but when she opened the door, she froze. Two unfamiliar men and a woman entered the apartment without an invitation. Does Mr. King live here? Dorothy took a step back. Yes. And who are you? Mrs. Green's voice came from the room. Dorothy, is Stephen back? No. One of the guests presented his official identification to the young woman. I'm senior court bailiff Mr. Hall, and these are my colleagues. We need to see Mr. King. Can we see him? No, he's not home. But can you tell me what's going on? The woman responded with a question. What is your relationship with him and why are you asking questions? I'm his wife and I have the right to know why you've come here. After all, this is a private residence. The unpleasant woman looked at Dorothy disdainfully. You hit the nail on the head. I think you won't be able to claim rights to this apartment soon. You're joking. This apartment belongs to my mother-in-law. But is Mr. King registered here? Yes, he is registered here. My son and I also live in this apartment. Travis didn't like his mother's long absence, so he dashed into the corridor. The guests didn't bother to close the door behind them, and a gust of cold air rushed into the apartment from the hallway. Dorothy didn't have time to catch the child, who began to play with the official's bag. Give it, give it. She roughly pushed the boy away from her. Mom, hold the baby. What a mess. How disgusting. He smeared me with something slippery. The child didn't like being treated that way, and he started crying while Dorothy rushed to rectify the situation. I'm sorry, we just finished eating and haven't had a chance to clean up yet. 
It's nothing serious, just milk soup. The woman forcefully pushed Dorothy's hand away. Don't touch me and don't talk to us. We don't have time to discuss the details of your everyday life. The senior court bailiff decided to intervene. The thing is, as far as I understand, your spouse is a chronic debtor. He has two outstanding loans, and the fines have already exceeded the amount he owes. That's why the bank had to take legal action. But I know nothing about this. What loan? We can barely make ends meet. I'm on maternity leave. The woman arrogantly remarked. That's your problem, my dear. We will now make an inventory of the property. What property? Everything that can compensate the bank for the losses. By the way, your spouse used this apartment as collateral. But that can't be. How? What are we going to do? My mother-in-law is paralyzed. Woman, we are not interested in your problems. You should have thought about it when you took out the loans. But I know nothing. Please, wait. Let us in and remove your child. Dorothy couldn't see anything through her tears, and Mrs. Green was in the same state. She tried to ask these stone-faced people something, but the unpleasant official cast an equally disdainful glance towards the sick woman. You should have cleaned up the place, and the smell is so heavy. After such tenants, I'll need cosmetic repairs. Mrs. Green called her daughter-in-law. Dorothy, I'm feeling unwell. The woman ran to the phone. I need to call an ambulance. Can't you see someone is unwell? The unpleasant woman smiled. It was a malicious smile. We've seen even more heart-wrenching scenes, so you don't have to try. Just endure it, it won't be long. There's nothing valuable here anyway, just a television. And what's in the kitchen? A microwave? Yes, but it's not new. I'm telling you, there's nothing that can cover the losses. The senior bailiff wrote something for a long time and then handed a document to Dorothy, who was sitting by her sick mother-in-law's bedside. Here's the order. You have one month to repay the debt. If this requirement is not met, you'll have to be evicted through court. So, I advise you to start taking action to find accommodation in advance because, as I understand, you have no money. No, but you don't have the right to evict us. I have a young child and a sick mother-in-law. The senior bailiff looked at Dorothy. I feel sorry for you, but the law is the same for everyone. And when it comes to money, there are no discounts for illnesses or age. I sincerely advise you to find another place to live, so that you won't be evicted by force. While Dorothy argued with the bailiffs, she didn't notice that Mrs. Green had gone quiet. Travis was being fussy in her arms, which was also a major distraction. Only after the visitors left, the young woman turned to her mother-in-law. They're gone, they even listed the pressure cooker and mixer. What are we going to do now? Mrs. Green remained silent. Dorothy rushed to her. Mrs. Green, are you feeling unwell? I'll call an ambulance right away. But the old woman's face already bore the unmistakable stamp of death. A cry of despair escaped from the young woman's chest. She cried beside the cooling body of the woman who had become dear and close to her over the years. Dorothy didn't know what to do or where to seek help. Stephen attempted to get up, but his head was throbbing as if someone was striking it with a sledgehammer. His mouth was dry, and he couldn't even separate his tongue from the roof of his mouth. From a distance, Thomas's voice reached his consciousness. Stephen, get up, we need to deal with this hangover. Stephen tried to open his eyes and muttered with difficulty. Where am I? Come on, a man. You got stuck at Oscar's place. What do you mean, forgot? Stephen tried to recall what happened yesterday and struggled to remember. He remembered going with Thomas to visit Oscar. But what happened next was completely erased from his memory. I don't remember anything. Thomas cheerfully suggested, here, take this medicine, it'll help. Stephen downed the glass his friend handed him and almost immediately felt relief. Yeah, we had a great time, I just don't remember what the occasion was. The owner of the apartment, which looked more like a shelter for the homeless, also chimed in cheerfully. 
Do normal guys need an occasion? A day lived is a good day. Oh, your wife called, and then she sent messages. Stephen reached into his jacket for his phone. Found it. She won't leave me alone. Well, you should have replaced her with someone else. Thank God, there are plenty of women on this earth. Thomas, I would gladly do that, but my mom is sick, you know that, and Dorothy is taking care of her. So, I have to endure her presence. Stephen started reading his wife's messages and suddenly began pacing in one place. Damn, I'm a real jerk. Thomas rushed to calm his friend. What happened? You're yelling as if someone flayed your skin. Thomas, it's even worse. Mom passed away, you understand. My mom died, and I was here drinking. Wait, stop yelling. Maybe it's a joke? Thomas, what are you talking about? Dorothy wouldn't joke about something like that. The feeling of alcohol-induced intoxication quickly vanished from his consciousness in the fresh air. Stephen ran, without paying attention to the road. Out of breath, he opened the door to the apartment and stood frozen, there was a dead silence. Dorothy. Dorothy. Where are you? No one answered him. Stephen turned on the light in the room where Mrs. Green had been bedridden for many years. Seeing the neatly made bed, he shouted at the top of his lungs. Mom, mommy. Why did you leave me? What am I supposed to do now? How can I go on? The neighbor from the apartment across the hall rushed in upon hearing the cry. She looked at the young man with disapproval as he continued to run around the apartment. It's too late, Stephen, you've realized it too late. We buried Mrs. Green this morning. Dorothy was waiting for you. Having a son like you, God forbid. The whole neighborhood gathered to give Mrs. Green a proper send-off. I'm not here to judge you, but only monsters treat their own mothers like this. Stephen started pacing the room again. You're right about everything, Mrs. Watson. But why didn't she call me? Dorothy called you, she was worried sick about you. And she did the right thing by leaving. How could she leave? Who allowed her to? The neighbor became frightened by Stephen's inappropriate behavior and started walking towards the door. There's a note on the table. She left it, along with a decree. What decree? I don't know, figure it out yourself. The door slammed shut loudly, and the man was left alone. Stephen began reading the document left by the court officials. Damn it. What am I supposed to do? That bitch abandoned me at such a moment. He read his wife's short note, I can't live like this anymore. Don't look for me. Who needs you? No one is going to look for you. Behaving like a princess when you're not even pretty, neither in face nor figure. He sent the most malicious wishes after his departed wife, but his anger lasted only a few minutes. Then his mind started clearing, and Stephen frantically dialed his wife's number, but the operator's voicemail informed him that the number didn't exist. She probably threw away her SIM card. Clever move. But I'll still find you, you treacherous snake, and you'll answer for everything. Left to the mercy of fate, the husband couldn't pinpoint exactly what his wife had done wrong to him. He continued running around the empty apartment for another half hour, but he was afraid to spend the night there. The only right course of action was to return to his friend Thomas, to share his grief with friends. At the time when Stephen cursed her with his final words, Dorothy was already far away. She called her mother's cousin and asked for shelter. Her aunt didn't refuse, but she asked. Dorothy, what happened to you? Aunt Carolina, I'll tell you everything later. Are your parents aware? Why don't you want to go back home? I can't for now, Aunt Carolina. I'm still completely bewildered. Please don't ask me. All right, I can't do without him. The bus was warm and cozy. Travis immediately fell asleep in his mother's arms, but restless thoughts didn't allow Dorothy to relax. The driver played popular songs to lift the passenger's spirits, but most often, hits from past years about hope were heard. A group of young people sitting at the back of the bus sang, Hope, my earthly compass, poorly. 
With bitterness, Dorothy thought that long ago, she too used to sing that song enthusiastically with her students who were sent to help farmers. It was a joyful and carefree time, and the naive girl who broke free believed that only happiness awaited her ahead. At just shy of 18 years old, she was shaken by the scale of city life, but she quickly adapted to the changes. Dorothy immediately decided to stay in the city after college. When she was offered a position at the clinic, she agreed without much thought. She also quickly gave a positive answer to Stephen, the son of a woman paralyzed after a stroke, whom she visited daily to administer injections and massages. The attention of the handsome athletic guy flattered Dorothy. Stephen had a way with words, and she absorbed every word he said. The young man was still studying at a construction university at that time and often told her about the cities of the future. In an ordinary girl's imagination, the fairy tale prince was exactly like Stephen, and Dorothy believed that she would bask in happiness with this person for her entire life. But the first months of marriage brought bitter disappointment, and Stephen didn't even hide the fact that he married her with the sole goal of obtaining a qualified caregiver for free. Dorothy, I'm incredibly lucky to have you. You understand that a man shouldn't be dealing with such delicate matters as caring for a sick woman. I have to rely on neighbors, and their services need to be paid for. Dorothy was shocked by such a revelation. Stephen, I thought you loved me. He gently embraced the bewildered girl. Of course, I do love you, but that doesn't prevent us from benefiting from it. By the way, it's advantageous for you too, we'll register you here, and you'll be able to find well-paying work in our city. All your friends will be envious. Indeed, many friends from medical college didn't hide their admiration. Dorothy, how lucky you are. You got a good guy as a husband and a comfortable apartment. Only your parents didn't approve of your marriage. Mrs. Anderson cried for a long time after meeting the new relatives. Dorothy, what a burden you've taken upon yourself. Mrs. Green is a good woman, but taking care of a sick person for years is very difficult, and your Stephen is a scoundrel. It's written all over his face. The girl tried to reassure her mother. I don't know what caused your antipathy, but Stephen is very kind, and I'm happy with him. Just be careful. I'm afraid you'll end up regretting it. There are so many cases like that, they get married, and then they come back to their parents with their heads down. Her mother's prediction deeply hurt the girl's self-esteem. You don't have to worry. I won't come crawling back to you with my head down, as you said. Mrs. Anderson further escalated the situation. And don't be mad at your mom. You know I'm telling the truth. There have been so many heroines in our village. Can't deny it. That's it. And then the gossip will start. Mom, don't worry. Everything will be fine for me. Dorothy pretended that everything was fine. However, she couldn't escape the fate of many naive girls. The cheerful voice of the driver interrupted her thoughts. Dear passengers. This is the final stop. Please, quickly exit the bus and don't leave your belongings behind. There were no welcoming people on the platform, but Dorothy noticed a familiar car nearby. Sympathetic passengers helped the young mother unload her belongings. Dorothy. I'm sorry, I didn't think it would be difficult for you with the baby and all. The woman picked up the luggage and quickly headed towards her car. Throughout the journey, she talked about the difficulties of her own life and, just before reaching home, she asked. Dorothy, please don't tell Uncle Kurt anything. He's eccentric and loves turning everything upside down. After a tiring journey, Dorothy didn't feel like eating much and only had a cup of tea. Aunt Carol allocated a room for the relatives, which belonged to her son who was studying at university. Get settled, and we'll talk about matters tomorrow. For the first time in the past few days, Dorothy fell into a deep sleep, and Travis blissfully slept next to her. The young mother was awakened by a loud conversation between the homeowners. She could distinctly hear every word her uncle said. Carolina, I'm amazed at your readiness to lend a helping hand to anyone. Dorothy is not just anyone to me, she's a relative. Yeah, tell me about it. But even considering the family connection, it's unjustified altruism. That's my opinion. Kurt, we need to help the girl. 
She has a nursing diploma, and such professionals are in high demand here. Carolina, tell me, why did your niece come to us with a child? Why didn't she go to her parents? The woman responded to her husband with undisguised irritation, she must have had her reasons. I'm not accustomed to prying into other people's souls. If she deems it necessary, she'll tell us herself. Well, make sure you don't end up crying over your own kindness. I'm telling you right now, I won't tolerate dependency in my house. Dorothy felt her face burning, but she waited another half hour so that her aunt wouldn't suspect that she overheard their argument. Mrs. Martinez cheerfully chatted about trivial matters, but beneath that feigned joy, tension was palpable. Therefore, Dorothy behaved awkwardly and tried to prevent any mischief from her little son. Please, eat without hesitation. I didn't know what to prepare for breakfast, but then I thought that buckwheat porridge with milk would suit everyone. It's nourishing and healthy. Aunt Carolina, there was no need to worry. I could have cooked myself. We could have gone to a cafe, I have money. Before I left, the neighbors helped with Travis, and I received a subsidy for him, and with my mother-in-law's funeral. The host sighed, what subsidy are you talking about? Can you live off that? And forget about cafes and other eateries. The last thing we need is for the child to get food poisoning. Adult food is harmful to his stomach. As long as you're our guest, don't even mention it. Aunt Carolina intentionally or unintentionally hinted at temporary hospitality, but her words once again hurt the young woman's heart. Aunt Carolina, please don't worry. I'll go right now and inquire about work. You'll find work, but what about the child? In daycare. My dear girl, they don't accept such young children nowadays. The daycare doesn't have a nursery group. Dorothy was at a loss. I didn't know. In the city, you can easily find a place for a child. There are plenty of private daycare centers. This isn't an ordinary city here, it's like a different civilization. You can find a nanny, of course, but the rates for such services are high. It's unlikely you can afford a nanny. And I work, so I can't help much either. Dorothy stood frozen in bewilderment. What should I do then? Eating won't satisfy you through conversation alone, but you need to seriously think about your situation. Aunt Carol encouragingly patted Dorothy on the shoulder. Don't be sad, it's not the end yet. Remember, even in the most hopeless situation, there's always a way out. Mrs. Martinez quickly cleared the table. She washed the dishes and hummed, a strange star shines, to make the process more enjoyable. A good song, positive. I love to sing while doing housework. After all, as one classic said, a song helps us build and live. Dorothy corrected her aunt, these are also lyrics from a song. The host triumphantly remarked, see, there's no need to be down. We'll definitely come up with something. When perfect order was restored in the kitchen, Mrs. Martinez peeked into the room where the guests were resting. Don't get bored here, I need to step out for a bit, but I'll be back soon. Less than an hour passed, and the delighted hostess announced from the doorway, Dorothy, I have good news for you. Her aunt's face was radiant with happiness, and that joy transferred to the young woman. Aunt Carolina, don't torture me. Tell me. Don't rush, maybe my offer will disappoint you. The woman changed her clothes leisurely and walked into the kitchen. It's freezing outside, we need to warm up. Mrs. Martinez drank hot tea while Dorothy sat across from her, anxiously waiting for her fate to be decided. Finally, her aunt warmed up and solemnly declared, I told you there are no hopeless situations. I didn't tell you immediately, I went to find out. Everything first. Anyway, here's how it stands. We have our grandfather's house in the city. Of course, that property is unlikely to provide a comfortable life, but at least there will be a roof over your head. A smile of joy slowly faded from Dorothy's face. Aunt, you don't mean that old building where Grandpa Jerome used to live, do you? That's exactly the house I'm talking about. Why are you so disappointed right away? It's a good house, sturdy. We used to spend the whole summer there. Indescribable beauty. Forest, river, mushrooms, and berries. I remember, Aunt Carolina. 
Ernest and I had a great time there. We even had our own gathering spot in the woods. Mrs. Martinez enthusiastically chimed in, yes, I remember how we searched for you, and you were hiding in the makeshift shelter. Then Grandpa gave us a hint about where you were hiding. And I remember the angry bees. They stung us so badly. Since then, I get scared at any buzzing sound. Yes, bees don't like rough treatment, but our grandpa had such wonderful honey. People used to come from the city to buy not only honey but also propolis and royal jelly from him. Grandpa Jerome was a skilled beekeeper. It's a pity his business didn't survive. Did you ever try to continue it? Dorothy, we had to sort out our own affairs here. In the beginning, we even grew vegetables on the garden beds there, but then we gave up. It's an expensive pleasure. Although it's not far, every trip to the summer house costs money. That's why Grandpa's mansion is unattended. A smile froze on Aunt's face, pleasant memories must have visited her. The nostalgic pause didn't last long. Mrs. Martinez tapped the table with a sense of purpose and declared in a business-like tone, I think it's not a bad option. The local authorities were already planning to demolish Grandpa's house, so they'll be happy they don't have to spend money on that. And for temporary housing, I believe the old house is quite suitable. There should be a supply of firewood too, unless the locals stole it. Can you operate a stove? Dorothy said quietly, yes. Well, that's great. Tomorrow morning, we'll head out on the road and check the condition of Jerome's palace. That's what the locals called Grandpa's house, you know why? I have no idea. Jerome was a stubborn man, and not everyone liked him in Telluride. He responded to his fellow villagers in the same way and didn't want to live next to those who slandered him behind his back. They say that Grandpa's ancestor was well off, and the new authorities even impoverished him and demolished his house. Jerome decided to build on the ancestral land, and it turned out that the house ended up in a remote area. The structure is impressive and stands on a hill, overlooking the whole town. That's why they called it the a palace. Interesting story. My mom never told me. Living in a small town, you'll hear even more than that, Carolina looked closely at her niece. Dorothy, I can see that you're not happy. No, Aunt Carolina, I'm very happy. It's just a little scary, how will I manage in the wilderness alone with a small child? Mrs. Martinez embraced the girl. Did you think I wanted to get rid of you as soon as possible? Oh no. I don't think that. And don't you dare. If you've already trusted me, believe that you've found a reliable helper and don't pay attention to your uncle. He'll grumble, but then he'll calm down. We won't abandon you to fate, and we'll help you in the beginning, and maybe life will get better. This reassurance from her aunt gave Dorothy a little hope, but the fear of the unknown was still stronger. It was a sunny January day. The sunlight bounced off the windshield, causing Mrs. Martinez's dissatisfaction. To reduce the risk of collision with another vehicle, she put on her sunglasses. The day today is unusual, as if it wants to support us. Dorothy had to bring her son with her, and she held him tightly in her arms. Looking back, Aunt noticed, if the police notice us, we'll definitely get fined. I don't have a child seat. Aunt Carolina, don't worry. I'll hold Travis tightly to me, and no one will notice. It would be better if it happened that way. I hope we'll get to the town quickly without any adventures. It's only about 10 kilometers away. But after the snowfall the day before, everyone was moving on the road at a minimum speed. The travelers spent almost an hour on the road, and then another hour covering a small stretch to reach the town. Yes, we should have checked the weather report first. I completely overlooked that. I'm all sweaty from this drive. I prefer to zip along with the wind. I never suspected that you liked extreme driving. Aunt winked mischievously. Dorothy, you have no idea what your aunt is capable of. Look, we're already being greeted. The whole town is waiting for us. One could guess the dwindling population of the dying town by the spirals of smoke rising from the chimney pipes. But apparently, news of the travelers who were already nearing the outskirts had spread through the snow-covered cottages. 
City dwellers rushed from different sides of the road, dressed in fur coats and women wearing down scarves in old-fashioned style. Ignoring the customary guest etiquette, grandmothers immediately started scrutinizing the newcomers. I can't believe my eyes. It's Carolina. What Carolina? Our saleswoman quit a long time ago. I'm not talking about her. It's Carolina, Jerome's granddaughter, the old beekeeper who passed away eight years ago. Oh. That's right, it's her. She hasn't been around for a long time. What made her come in the middle of winter? The explanation was about to be given by the grandfather with his stylish walking cane. What's so hard to understand here? Our deputy announced back in the fall that abandoned houses would be demolished. Jerome's palace has long been abandoned, and no one takes care of the property. So Carolina probably came to check on her real estate. Mrs. Martinez pretended not to hear anything and greeted the residents of Newport. Good day. How are you doing? Grandpa Franklin tapped his cane with a flourish. Oh, nothing much. We're alive, chewing bread, and not expecting guests. See, I expressed myself well. Like a poet. The old. Ladies laughed together, which Grandpa interpreted as a recognition of his talent. But his moment of glory was short-lived. Calm down, Franklin, let me talk to the person. The old man glared at his wife indignantly but didn't argue. And what's with your fashion, Barbara? Ruining the mood? You don't let me get a word in. Well, your tongue is like a broom, speaking without thinking and not in a straight line. The townsfolk aren't interested in listening to your tales. How do you know about their interests? The small audience came to life, expecting to witness another family scandal, but Mrs. Martinez had no intention of participating in such events. To lower the emotional tension, she friendly asked, Tell me, can we drive to my grandfather's palace? The old ladies interrupted each other, giving recommendations. If you go around through Springfield, then it's possible, but not directly. It would be a long distance. You can go straight as well. Franklin proudly stepped forward and tapped his cane like a staff. Why are you misleading the person? It's clear that women are brainless creatures. The women hissed at the old man, and Barbara even made a gesture, but the grandfather demonstratively raised his cane above his head. What a fuss! Am I not right? Who's giving such foolish advice? Whether it's a straight path or a circle, it's useless and dangerous, the car will get stuck in snowdrifts. Who will pull it out? I'll show you, young lady, a reliable way to the palace. Grandpa Franklin gallantly offered his elbow to Mrs. Martinez. Barbara couldn't stand it. Look at him. Sand is already pouring out of him like a fountain, and he's pretending to be a gentleman. Just wait until we get home, I'll show you. And what's this secret path you have? The old man tried to go around his better half, but she stood like a boulder in the middle of the road. Grandpa wasn't going to give up. He understood the importance of his mission and sternly ordered, get off the road, Barbara, nicely. See, people need help. Contrary to the expectations of those present, the bulky wife of the old man obediently stepped aside, muttering something under her breath, guide, amateur, you'll get lost soon enough. While this lively dispute was going on, nobody paid attention to the passengers in the car, waiting for its conclusion. When Grandpa Franklin walked ahead, motioning for Carolina to follow him, Dorothy also got out of the car. The women said in unison, so Carolina didn't come alone? Who is that with her? Maybe her daughter? No, she has a son, Ernest. Wait, ladies, I think I know who that is. Remember Charlotte, Carolina's sister? Exactly, a spitting image of Charlotte. And she came with a child. It's not a coincidence. Dorothy felt uncomfortable with the unabashed scrutiny of her person and the lively discussions about the purpose of their visit, but Franklin hurried to reassure her. Don't pay attention to our women, young lady. We live a boring life here, so they're happy with any occurrence. But our women are very kind, they never refuse to help. The old man led the guests along a narrow winding path. The shortest way to the beekeeper's palace is from our house. 
Excuse me, but I occasionally visit there out of necessity. Mrs. Martinez asked in surprise, may I know what this necessity is? The grandfather looked around and then whispered, well, my wife, as you've seen, is a gorgon in the flesh, and I'm a healthy man, despite my age. Sometimes I need to let off some steam. Mrs. Martinez coughed. The elderly guide realized that he hadn't expressed himself clearly and quickly corrected his mistake. Don't think badly of me, I haven't been chasing after women for a long time, although I used to be guilty of it. Now my friend and I occasionally gather in secret to relieve stress. Our homemade drink works best for such matters. It's a divine drink my Barbara makes. Like tears. The women laughed loudly, understanding that Grandpa Franklin was enthusiastically talking about vodka. Encouraged by the laughter, Grandpa quickened his pace. Soon the expedition had arrived at their destination. Here we are. We should have timed how long it took us to get here. No more than five minutes. The guide looked at Dorothy. Probably around that. So, where is your child sleeping? It's a boy, Travis. He's shy around strangers, not used to it. That's all right, it's a acquired taste. You explore here, and I'll bring you back later. The house was quiet. Dorothy felt like they were in the middle of a movie set. Strangers stared at them from black and white photographs hanging on the walls. Mrs. Martinez whispered, explaining, these are all our relatives. Jerome carefully kept the pictures. There's a lot of other stuff in chests as well. Aunt Carolina, I have a feeling that we're in a parallel dimension right now. There's a bit of that. Whenever I visited Grandpa, it always felt that way to me. A little eerie, too. A massive oak door slammed shut, and Timothy headed to the kitchen with a bundle of firewood. We'll create some comfort soon. The house is still good, sturdy, the walls ring because they're made of oak, they used to build things properly back then. Now you touch it with your finger. And there's a hole. Mr. Miller, maybe you shouldn't have started the fire? We'll be heading back soon. Aunt Carolina, can we stay with Travis? What? It's cold here. We'll need to burn firewood for a week. The kind guide, aware of the situation, remarked, in an hour or so, it'll be like the tropics here. You can live in the house, although, of course, Jerome's heaps have deteriorated. The shed is almost falling apart, and through the roof of the shed, you can count the stars at night. Dorothy looked at the house with a vague feeling. Throughout the journey, she had imagined seeing a semi-ruined structure, but everything looked as if the owners had temporarily stepped out and would return home any moment. Mrs. Martinez watched her. Maybe you'll change your mind? How will you feed Travis? Mr. Miller, what time does your store close? The old man smirked. Yes, it's been seven years since our store closed. Carolina worked there, deceiving everyone, and then she was fired. They said it wasn't profitable to keep a shop here. And where do you get groceries? That's no problem for us. Every other day, a mobile store comes, and if someone wants, they can go to another town right through the city. The store there is open until morning. You see, Dorothy, we'll have to postpone the move. Mr. Miller objected, why postpone? Even though visitors rarely come to our town, we'll always find something to treat them with. The old man touched the stove. Feel how warm it is. Let's add a bit more in a minute. Indeed, the old house quickly filled with warmth. Grandpa Franklin showed the guests where the well was and went to get groceries. Meanwhile, the women cleaned the floor and dusted off the accumulated dirt. Mrs. Martinez began to say, Goodbye. It's time for me to leave, it's dangerous to drive on such a road in the dark. I'll definitely come by tomorrow. And you, Dorothy, give me a call. Mr. Miller, how's the connectivity here? We're not complaining. My Barbara calls her granddaughter almost every day, just a waste of money. Don't worry, we'll take care of your niece. No one will harm them here. The firewood crackled peacefully in the stove, and the comforting warmth not only warmed their bodies, but also penetrated their souls. Dorothy held her sleeping son close to her chest. Here we are, my son, city dwellers. 
how quiet and peaceful it is here. I've longed for such tranquility. Just as the dawn was breaking through the windows, a soft knock came at the door. Dorothy thought it was the old man coming to check on them, but Barbara stepped into the house with dignity. The elderly woman spoke to Dorothy as if they were old acquaintances. How are you settled in? Did. You freeze? Thanks to Mr. Miller, he helped us a lot yesterday. My old man is ready to help everyone, that's undeniable. And to you, Dorothy, I came for this reason. Don't invite him to your home too often. I don't understand. What are you talking about, Barbara? Mrs. Miller, can I see through you? The young woman became confused. I'm still too young for the title of a Mrs., although in our town, that custom is also common. So, I'm Mrs. King. The guest was delighted. Where did you come from, if it's not a secret? What's the secret here? My parents live in the west of the country. Yes, that's very far. But don't worry, you'll get used to it quickly. We have pristine places here, as they say now, clean ecology. Yes, that's highly valued nowadays. I used to visit my grandfather here several times when I was a child. My husband and I were reminiscing yesterday, or rather, he reminded me that you're Charlotte's daughter. Although he drinks a lot of alcohol sometimes, he has a good memory. Actually, it's for this very reason that I decided to visit you. My husband jokes about it sometimes. Mrs. Miller expressively gestured with her hand at the junction of her neck and lower jaw. It was done so comically that Dorothy couldn't help but laugh, but the guest was slightly offended. There's not much to laugh about. It may be joyful for you young ones, but what am I supposed to do if my old man hops on a horse? Hops on a horse? Oh my, and you claim to be from a small town. Although maybe you have completely different manners there. In our place, we use the expression, hops on a horse, when death comes with a scythe. So, I'm worried about my old man, he loves that business and always tries to have a drink everywhere. Mrs. Miller, rest assured that I'll let you know right away if anything happens. The elderly woman became sentimental. Thank you for understanding. I don't mind if he drinks a little. But do men know moderation? No matter how much you give them, it's never enough. And they're not so young anymore to swing a sword, but he still doesn't want to understand, the guest joked, heading towards the exit but then waved her hands. Oh, I forgot. I came here for a reason. To warn you that the store is coming to our place today. If you need to stock up, don't be late, come around 12 o'clock. Before Mrs. Miller's steps had subsided, Grandpa Franklin appeared. My Gorgon was here. Why do you say? That, Mr. Miller? Mrs. Miller is a very pleasant woman. Ah. Uh. You don't know her. She's just pretending to be kind. She's genuinely concerned about your well-being. The old man looked at Dorothy with surprise. This is unexpected for me. And what did she tell you? She probably complained to you that I'm an inveterate alcoholic. No, your wife didn't say anything like that. But as a healthcare worker, I wouldn't advise you to indulge too much in invigorating drinks either. Grandpa froze. Are you a doctor? No, I'm a nurse. That changes things. Grandpa quickly turned around 180 degrees and ran down the path. Amazing things. Travis, let's get ready for a walk. The little one happily ran around the spacious room, grabbing his things. But the biggest surprise awaited Dorothy ahead. From a distance, she noticed a crowd waiting for the arrival of the store. But the old men and women weren't idle, they were dancing. As much as possible with a stroller, the woman hurried to the site of the impromptu celebration. Mrs. Miller, in a low voice, almost with a masculine tenor, sang cheerful verses, while the others danced a lively dance. Oh, girls, how we're having fun. It's a pity we don't have an accordion, or we'd dance like in our youth. Dorothy started clapping her hands, and even little Travis joined in the general joy. The little one enjoyed the dance so much that somehow he managed to free himself from the stroller's straps, which held him back from falling while in motion. The boy squealed with delight. 
he spun in place and then squatted, trying to imitate the movements of the adults. Grandpa Franklin conducted with his cane. What wonders our city quadrille creates. Even the little boy couldn't resist. Our boy, it's clear from the start. And how can you not believe in the connection of generations here? The restless grandpa was ready to philosophize some more on his favorite topic, but the store arrived, and the residents of the small town lined up. Dorothy bought everything she needed and hurried home. The whole evening, Travis repeated the movements of the amazing dance with abandon, and the process clearly brought the little one pleasure. Dorothy watched him and mentally noted how everything had changed in just a few days. Her son had never been so active. Perhaps even the air here was healing. The first week of life in the new place flew by like a single day. Dorothy tried to settle in, and the neighbors helped her. Aunt. Visited the newcomers every other day. One day, Mrs. Martinez arrived accompanied by her husband. Mr. Martinez took a television out of the car. Although it's old, the picture is clear. You can watch series and cartoons with Travis. But that's not all the gifts. We brought you some food to eat. Dorothy was pleased with such attention from relatives, but at the same time, she didn't want to burden them with unnecessary worries. Thank you very much, but we already have everything we need. Take it, a backup won't hurt. And Dorothy, call us more often. Now Mrs. Martinez and I feel responsible for you, so to speak. Uncle shyly averted his eyes, as if he were somehow at fault. From his behavior, Dorothy guessed that the kind aunt had done some preventive work with her spouse in advance. Dorothy went out to see off the guests and unexpectedly noticed that the narrow path had turned into a well-trodden trail. Aunt gave her a meaningful wink. I would call this path the road of kindness. I've always been amazed at the generosity of the people in this small town. Yes, there are really good people here, mostly. Dorothy didn't tell her relatives that she had already heard unpleasant remarks about herself, but she tried not to react to gossip. As old Barbara said, they'll gossip for a bit and then get tired. It's not worth paying attention to such trivialities. Dorothy took a short walk with her son in the fresh air and was about to head home when she noticed an unfamiliar woman on the path. It's hard to reach you, difficult to overcome without preparation. I'm here to see you, Mrs. King. The formal address from this well-dressed lady confused the young woman. I see you weren't expecting guests. I'm Deputy Edwards. Nice to meet you. Perhaps we'd better go inside. Yes, it'll be more comfortable to talk there. I have a matter to discuss with you. The guest took off her fur coat and headed towards the stove. It's warm and cozy here, hard to believe that not long ago this house was completely abandoned. Are you planning to stay with us for long? I don't know yet, but I would like to stay here longer. That's wonderful. When you decide to formalize everything with registration, let me know. I'll definitely help you. And now, about the matter. I heard that you're a nurse. Yes, I finished college, but I only worked for three years before getting married, then maternity leave. And then I had to move, and I ended up here. I won't ask you what happened. Nothing special. I was taking care of my sick mother-in-law while my husband was indulging in his favorite pastimes, drinking and partying, accumulating debts. He wanted to start a business but failed, and one unfortunate day, bailiffs came and seized all our property. Mrs. Edwards sighed. Sympathetically. You had a tough time, but don't be disheartened. You won't be lost here with us. I've already realized that. Everyone here takes care of me and my son. They bring treats every day. Although, I must say, I've noticed something suspicious. There are indeed good people here, but it's still not wise to trust everyone blindly. I don't want to upset you unnecessarily, but information has already come in that you leave your child alone and lead a reckless life. Dorothy couldn't contain her indignation. Me? Leading a reckless life? But that's not true. Who could say such a thing? It's impossible to determine the source of the rumors, but I can see that you've been slandered. And to prevent further talk like this, I want to offer you a job. But I have a child. 
Where can I leave him? The little one won't be a problem. Our social worker quit, and three old ladies are left without supervision. As a nurse, you can take care of their health and help around the house. It's a temporary job for now, but you'll be able to earn a bit. Are you interested? Of course, thank you so much. Throughout the evening, Dorothy pondered on who could be obstructing her arrival in this quiet town. The positive mood she had been in for the past week vanished, replaced by doubt and a sense of uncertainty. Stephen is right, I'm a naive fool who trusts everyone blindly. From now on, I'll be smarter. After the visit from Mrs. Edwards, Dorothy no longer opened up her soul to anyone. She was friendly with the townspeople but didn't confide in anyone or accept treats from neighbors. To avoid hurting people unnecessarily, she would say that she and her son had everything they needed. Taking care of the helpless elderly added some variety to her life, but the young woman didn't feel completely fulfilled. An unexpected solution came from Grandpa Franklin. The breath of spring was already in the air, and the town's residents began to slowly plan how to make the most of their land. On this matter, the ever-present neighbor came to Dorothy. Working on the land might not be familiar to you. Why? My mom and I planted vegetables every year. That's good. The land likes care. If you need any plowing, let me know. I have my own tractor. I provide services to everyone for natural payment. Dorothy immediately deciphered the old man's cunning move. All right, I'll keep that in mind, but I'll probably manage on my own. Travis and I don't need much, and... I'll dig with a shovel. It's up to the master to decide. I had one more thing to offer. I have a debt that hasn't been paid. Jerome, may he rest in peace, the old man glanced at the corner with a red icon and crossed himself, helped me with beekeeping back in the day. Now I want to repay the favor by doing something good in his memory. Mr. Miller. What are you getting at? Oh, you're not quick to catch on. I'll give you beehives to start with. Your little boy is growing up, and he needs honey for good health. Dorothy waved her hands. What are you talking about? These insects bit me so much in my childhood that I'm still afraid of any buzzing. A bee is a noble creature. It was created by the Lord for the benefit of humans, and there's no need to fear it. I'll show you everything and give you a kind of master class. And in return, you can give me injections for my radiculitis as prescribed by the doctor. Mr. Miller, aren't you ashamed? I can give you injections without your bees. I'm not used to living for free. It's a shame you're refusing because beekeeping is a useful and highly profitable business. You won't even notice how you get involved. At first, Dorothy found this idea fantastic, but during the cleanup of the attic, she stumbled upon a bundle of old books. Bees and honeycombs adorned all the covers. Out of simple curiosity, she started reading but soon couldn't put them down. When Grandpa Franklin arrived for another visit, Dorothy showed him the books. The neighbor's eyes lit up. Yes, this is a treasure trove. You can't buy such literature today. Well done, Jerome, leaving such a rich inheritance. Dorothy, can I read them? Everything is explained step by step, and the best breeds are described. And I thought all bees were the same. What are you thinking? Beekeeping is a whole science. And Dorothy patiently began studying this science, although she hadn't made a final decision yet. At the end of spring, Dorothy and her son visited her parents for the first time. Mrs. Anderson nostalgically admired Grandpa Jerome's property, while her father's face was as dark as a cloud. Mr. Anderson didn't even want to enter the house. This was his way of expressing his displeasure with his daughter's actions. The mother anxiously glanced at him but didn't dare to initiate an unpleasant conversation. During the tour of the estate, the head of the family clicked his tongue and shook his head the whole time. Finally, he voiced his dissatisfaction. So, what have you? Proven to anyone? You left your husband to fate, moved to the middle of nowhere, and all for this barn? The mother pleaded, Kevin, please don't do this. I know what I'm doing. It's all because of you, Charlotte, the fruits of your upbringing. Our daughter is not of this world. 
Kevin, it's just a big city. And I told you she shouldn't have stayed there. She finished college and should have come home. But you, Charlotte, indulged her every desire. And now. She's alone, without a husband, with a child in her arms. Tell me, why did you leave? Before, Dorothy was afraid to disobey her father. Every word he spoke was an order to her, but now she calmly watched him and no longer felt fear of disobedience. The girl realized that she had grown up and decided to remind her parents of that. Mom, Dad, thank you for coming. I understand that you worry about me, but let me decide my own destiny. Mr. Anderson wanted to say something harsh but faltered when he met his daughter's gaze. Dorothy continued. I don't want to bore you with the story of my married life, but perhaps there's no need. I couldn't stay with a man who used me for five long years. Mrs. Anderson was occupied with her grandson. So, he used you? How? Typically, mom. He admitted himself that he married me because he had no one else to care for his paralyzed mother. The woman exclaimed in disbelief. But he told us such beautiful stories. He called you? Yes, and he visited. He's still looking for you, wants to come back. I hope you didn't give him my contact information? The parents exchanged glances. No. Caroline asked us not to do that. I also beg you not to. Travis and I are doing well here. No need to fear scandals, waiting for our father to come back in what form and when. There were still traces of unpleasant emotions on Mr. Anderson's face, but he was no longer as determined as when he first arrived, and his heart had been melted by his grandson. Travis was already babbling away, although not all the words were understandable. Noticing that his grandfather was watching him, the boy approached and, gesturing actively with his hands, started telling him about his problem. The dog went there, and mom said, Uh, uh, to her. Dorothy translated. He's talking about the neighbor's dog to you. A very friendly dog, but he likes to steal and eat things. He took Travis' toy, and I had to deal with the four-legged troublemaker. Travis listened attentively to the translation, then, to confirm its correctness, he clapped his hands and started dancing to his own accompaniment. Touched by the little boy's performance, his grandmother wiped away tears of affection. What a clever boy. He showed us everything. Pleased with her son's praise, Dorothy said, I don't know who he takes after, but he loves performing in public. When the mobile store comes, our Travis gives solo concerts and entertains the elderly. Suddenly, Mr. Anderson awkwardly said, that's because of me. When I was little, my father would take me to the field, and I would entertain everyone during recess. And I would get candy as a reward for a good performance. The clearing near the house fell silent, only birds chirped in different voices. Dorothy offered again, please come inside, it's like you're not even family. The parents exchanged glances once more, but there was more warmth and joy in their eyes this time. The farewell was long and touching. Mrs. Anderson held her grandson close to her chest and showered him with kisses. Mr. Anderson, who was always sparing with his words, couldn't hold back either. Dorothy, if you decide, come visit. Know that you have family who cares about you. Your mother and I have decided to help you financially a little, the man pulled out his wallet and took out a few large bills. Buy what you need, my daughter. Dorothy took the money. Thank you. It's very timely. I want to buy some strong queen bees now. Mrs. Anderson exclaimed in surprise, who? Mom, I've decided to get into beekeeping. First, I'll give it a try, and then we'll see. Mr. Miller, our neighbor, gave me two beehives, but he has problems with queen bees himself. Now I can buy them myself. I'll order elite bees that are adapted to our climate and have high productivity. Mr. Anderson looked closely at his daughter. If you're interested, give it a try. Just know that beekeeping is a complex matter that doesn't tolerate. Negligence. I know, Dad. I've already studied so much literature, and our neighbor has briefed me on everything. The location here is great, you could say it's pristine. Surrounded by forests, meadows, and no chemicals. 
The parents exchanged glances once again. Dorothy overheard her father saying to her mother as they got into the car, We didn't even notice how our daughter grew up and became independent. With the money her father gave her, the young woman bought a few more beehives and pedigreed queen bees. Soon, she and Grandpa Franklin harvested their first honey crop. The viscous amber substance brought them great joy. It worked. Mr. Miller, I did it. Grandpa gently stroked his thick beard. And it couldn't have been any other way. You worked hard, and the bees rewarded you. Now you just have to keep bottling and sell the excess. Where? Go to the market in the neighborhood, they'll snatch it from your hands. Such a high-quality product. Oh, but how do I get there? Take the bus, the old man paused, mentally figuring out a way out of the difficult situation. No, the bus definitely won't work here. You can borrow my bicycle for now, and then you can buy your own. And my old lady will look after Travis. By the end of summer, Dorothy had her own two-wheeled transport, and she was making rainbow plans for the future. The girl didn't expect that beekeeping could bring a stable income, and she was growing to love this activity more and more each day. As summer drew to a close, Dorothy received a call from Ernest, Mrs. Martinez's son. This call was particularly surprising because Dorothy didn't maintain a relationship with her cousin. They only spent summers together at Grandpa Jerome's in their distant childhood and crossed paths a few times at family gatherings. Dorothy was surprised by the unexpected call. Ernest was satisfied with the impression he made. It's clear from your voice that you're shocked, sis, but I'll continue to amaze you. Ernest, I don't mind, just don't forget that I have a child, and I don't want him to be an orphan. You think poorly of me. I'm not a monster to drive a woman to despair. It was your lovely aunt who gave me an idea. Oh, Aunt Carolina. Well, that's expected. Your mother is an extraordinary woman. Yes, she's unmatched when it comes to unconventional ideas. So here's the thing, I have a vacation coming up, and I'm sick and tired of going abroad. I want to relax at home, in nature. Ernest, come to us in Taos if that option suits you. It does. Mrs. Martinez advised me to reach out to you, said you're kind and won't refuse hospitality to two wanderers. Dorothy was. Taken aback. Two. Are you coming with your wife or your girlfriend? I missed the mark a little. I do have a friend, and, by the way, he's my boss. He loves fishing and mushrooms, and now is the perfect time. I wouldn't have thought about the city if it weren't for my mom. And it's good that you remembered. Come over. Don't worry, we won't impose on you. And I'll proudly tell you, Kyle and I are all about a healthy lifestyle, so we have a negative attitude towards alcohol. Ernest, no need for further explanations. Just come, period. For the second time in less than a year, the small town experienced such a significant event. All the residents who could move on their own lined up at the entrance to the settlement. Folding their hands like visors, the elderly men and women peered into the distance where a white dot was growing larger with each passing second. Grandpa Franklin had the sharpest vision because he underwent annual checkups at the district hospital. As the chief expert, the old man said, a white car, a foreign one. We haven't had those come here before. Maybe some relatives have come to visit someone's soul. The old man looked meaningfully at the crowd of townspeople, but almost simultaneously, they shook their heads. No, we don't have any relatives like that. These are strangers, maybe coming for honey from Mrs. King. Heads turned once again towards the mansion. To an outside observer, it might have seemed that the townspeople had participated in a well-rehearsed flash mob, their movements were so synchronous. Franklin croaked approvingly and waved his walking stick. Exactly, guests for Dorothy. But who could it be? Carolina has a different car, and this one is all shiny. The luxurious white sedan smoothly entered the main and only street and came to a stop. Mr. Miller couldn't tear his admiring gaze away from the car. The impression was so strong that the old man almost lost the ability to speak. He caressed the car with his calloused hand and whispered, What beauty! Can't take my eyes off it, like a carriage from a fairy tale. 
the arrivals gave the old man a chance to express his feelings. Ernest was the first to step out of the car. Good day to all of you. Grandpa spoke for everyone, and good health to you. Who have we welcomed? When Ernest's companion also left the car, the women started chattering. He looks like a deputy they showed on TV. You're blind, Brittany. That deputy is old, and this one is very young. Probably the boss. Ernest smirked. He was well. Acquainted with local etiquette and knew that the townspeople immediately labeled anyone in a suit as a boss. Grandmas and grandpas were not bosses. We've come to your little corner of paradise to relax. The crowd came alive. Everyone started eagerly describing the merits of the place. It's great here. The mushrooms and berries are plentiful right now. Ernest caught the right wave. And what about fishing? It varies, but we're not in need. If we want, there's always fresh fish on the table. Then we haven't made a mistake. The little grandmother stood out from the crowd. And who do you belong to? I'm Dorothy's brother. She lives here with grandpa in the mansion. You should have said so right away, visiting Mrs. King. Instead, you're talking about fishing and mushrooms. And who's with you? This is my colleague, his name is Kyle. He's my boss. Franklin looked displeased at Ernest. And you said he's not the boss. My eyes are sharp, I never make mistakes. The young men exchanged glances and laughed. Kyle said to his friend, never thought our arrival would cause such a stir. And indeed, it's great here. Such a vibrant atmosphere. Ernest patted his companion on the shoulder. Kyle, this is just the beginning. You'll get to taste the full vibrancy later, but one thing's for sure, we won't be bored here. The young men didn't notice Dorothy rushing to the meeting place. Ernest, you should have called. I saw you late. Yeah, it's fine. We chatted with the people here, learned a lot of interesting things. And you, little sister, you've changed a lot. I imagined you differently. You too. So many years have passed. Yeah, we'll have to start getting to know each other anew. Kyle didn't say a word. He looked at Dorothy, a mix of admiration and surprise in his gaze. Dorothy, meet Kyle. You've made an irreversible impression on my friend and boss. You could say you've enchanted him. Ernest's companion smiled awkwardly and tried to explain his confusion. I'm truly amazed. Just the other day, I was at an art gallery. There's an exhibition by a budding artist, and one of the paintings depicts a girl who looks very much like you. It's simply a copy. It's so unexpected that I'm just stunned. What's the name of the painting? Honey Queen. It depicts a girl walking in a meadow with a wreath on her head and bees buzzing around. Very vibrant colors, very sunny. I don't know about the colors, but the name is very fitting, right on the mark. Grandpa Franklin overheard the conversation and was delighted with the fitting nickname for his neighbor. He roused the women who were examining the white car. Ladies, how do you like the name Honey Queen? Grandpa, have you gone mushroom crazy? Or did you start drinking alcohol in the morning that queens are appearing to you? Look, Barbara will find out and tear you to pieces. Dorothy warned the guests, we need to move the car, otherwise they'll dismantle it for spare parts. You can drive around here, I'll show you. Dorothy constantly caught Kyle's gaze on herself. His attention was pleasant to her, but at the same time, it frightened her. Ernest smirked as he observed the adults pretending that nothing was happening. One day, seizing a convenient moment, Ernest, with a hint, said to the girl, you've completely captivated Kyle. By the way, he's not yet bound by the ties of marriage. Although the female half of our group is constantly working on that matter. Dorothy looked at her brother as if he had said something indecent. Ernest, I can never get used to your jokes. I'm dead serious. I'm not blind, and I see how Kyle can't take his eyes off you. Seize the opportunity, an enviable suitor. One time is enough for me. I think your friend has a more worthy candidate in mind. Why would he want a woman with a child? 
Why degrade yourself like that? Ernest, I ask you, please, stop talking about it. Fine, agreed, but you can't go against fate, keep that in mind. Dorothy went fishing with the men, something she had never done before. Little Travis also showed interest in river fishing, and Ernest made a miniature fishing rod for him out of a branch. In the evenings, they sat in the palace courtyard under the stars. Dorothy listened to the heartfelt songs Kyle sang while playing the guitar and dreamed of a love like that. The past slowly receded, and her heart longed to be filled with a new feeling. But besides compliments and gazes, Kyle didn't dare to do anything more serious, and the budding feeling froze in anticipation. Meanwhile, Grandpa Franklin didn't lose heart. The arrival of the guests spurred him to even greater activity. Several times he offered the men to try Barbara's potion, but they categorically refused. The old man had no choice but to resume his secret meetings with Mr. Clark. However, since Mrs. Miller loathed the creepy old man, the old friends had to frequently change the location of their private meetings. One day, a real incident occurred. After fishing, everyone was heading back home. Suddenly, a loud scream came from the mansion. People, help. Dorothy rushed through the prickly shrub towards the house. It sounds like Grandpa Franklin is screaming. Her brother and Kyle also hurried after the girl. Shouts were heard again, but this time two people were calling for help. Ernest outpaced his sister. If I'm not mistaken, they're shouting from your beehive area. Probably the wrong bees have stung poor Winnie the Pooh. Mr. Miller was crying and pressing a handkerchief to his swollen face, while his friend, Mr. Clark, who had suffered less from the insects, sat next to him on the bench. The old man explained what had happened. I always did it this way, and there was never a failure. But this time, it's all because of Dorothy's fancy bees. Our own bees are not enough for her, she bought German ones, and by definition, they don't get along with our bees. Dorothy changed the ice packs and tried to calm the old man. Mr. Miller, the lineage of the bee queens has nothing to do with it. You yourself taught me that we must not rudely intrude into the lives of these little creatures. You violated that rule and got what you deserved. You can't neglect protective measures. The old man irritably threw away the compress. Mrs. King, what protection is there when people's pipes burst? Mr. Clark supported his unfortunate comrade, and the bitten orator continued, You see, even Mr. Clark confirms it. For the sake of safety, I hid a bottle of alcohol in your hive a while ago, so that my Barbara wouldn't find it. And then an opportunity presented itself, and Mr. Clark and I decided to have a little sip. I see, and those audacious bees attacked and stung you. That's right. Monsters, I'll never forgive them. Mr. Miller, do you want to destroy my bees? Oh, Mrs. King, I didn't mean to say that in my suffering, but your bees are malicious. Mine are tame, they don't sting. You just need to find another place for your bottles, and everything will be fine. Ernest and Kyle stood aside, laughing at the unfortunate old men. Later, out of sympathy, they even agreed to join them for a drink of disinfecting beverage. The old men considered it a great honor, but their evening of relaxation was interrupted by Barbara, who silently burst into the clearing. For some reason, she directed all her complaints towards Dorothy. I asked you, Mrs. King, not to invite my husband here, and what do you do? You. Ruin the man. Mrs. Miller, what does that have to do with me? Take care of your own husband. I probably have nothing better to do than to keep an eye on him. Barbara did not expect such resistance. So that's how you talk. And all this time, you pretended to be meek. Let me remind you once again that if you keep getting the local men drunk, I'll turn your life into hell. Mr. Miller tried to reason with his wife, but she kicked him towards the house. Yes, she ruined our celebration. Dorothy tried not to show that the unpleasant scene had affected her. Ernest gloomily remarked, Remember, Kyle, I told you about the local flavor. Well, this is it, unique and unmatched. City dwellers may seem open, but some of them have a chip on their shoulder, and if the wind blows in the wrong direction, they pull out that stone. Dorothy tried to ease the situation. I'm used to it, and I don't take offense. We didn't invent these laws, and it's not up to us to change them. 
Trust me, tomorrow morning Grandma Barbara will show up as usual, talking about the news as if nothing happened, and scolding Grandpa Franklin. Ernest smirked sourly. You're right, sis. There's no other way to handle it here. It's a shame we won't witness touching scenes of remorse. Why? It's time for us to return, work is waiting. We've decided to leave early in the morning to make it back by evening. That's too bad. We'll definitely come back. The fishing here is amazing, and we'll keep in touch with you. Now that you have the internet, we can talk anytime. The girl didn't expect that her life would become more comfortable with Kyle's arrival. The young man was knowledgeable about new technologies and helped her install useful applications. Later, she bought a laptop. The evening before the guest's departure passed quietly. Travis slept in his mother's arms. In the darkness, Dorothy didn't notice when Ernest nudged his companion, but Kyle only asked, would you mind if I call you? The girl laughed. Of course not, I wouldn't mind. We'll have plenty to talk about. If possible, could you send me a photo of that painting to my phone? Which one? The one you told me about. The Honey Queen. Deal, I'll do it at the earliest opportunity. Kyle kept his promise and sent Dorothy a photo of the painting with the unusual name the next day. This gesture warmed the young. Woman's heart and a new hope glimmered ahead like a little star. Two days later, he called her. The new love was nothing like the youthful feeling that drives one to make impulsive moves. Dorothy patiently awaited his calls, and they spoke for about 10 to 15 minutes on trivial topics. Neither of them dared to mention the main thing. But on the eve of Christmas, instead of the usual phone call, Dorothy saw the familiar white car. This time Kyle arrived alone, and the townspeople greeted him as an old acquaintance. Mr. Miller knocked on the door. Go, Mrs. King, greet your boss. Travis was absorbed in playing with his cars. And the woman, throwing a coat over her shoulders, rushed out of the house. Kyle walked towards her with a bouquet of flowers. Although it's customary to give fir branches for New Year, I decided to break the rules. Dorothy gratefully accepted the bouquet and invited the guest into the house, but Kyle made a warning gesture. Just a minute. I have all kinds of food in my car. Today, I've decided to play Santa Claus, if you don't mind, of course. Dorothy hadn't seen such an abundance of provisions in a long time. Only recently, thanks to the apiary, she had started allowing herself to buy various delicacies, but mostly, the money she earned was saved for buying a car. Kyle, why so much? Why did you spend on all this gastronomic abundance? But they say you spend the year as you ring in the new year. And I really want you and Travis to always have everything you need. By the way, I have a special gift for him. In the end, the man retrieved a huge box from the car. It's a robot. I hope he'll have more fun with it because there's no one to play with in the city. Travis reacted enthusiastically to the gift. The robotic machine was almost his height. Pressing a button made the mechanical man walk pressing another button made it speak. Kyle, but it's a very expensive toy. The young man smiled at the happy mother. Money means nothing compared to emotions. Look at the delight on Travis's face from his new friend. Kyle sat on the floor next to the child and began to explain how to operate the robot. The child quickly caught on. Within an hour, he was operating the machine himself and shouting with joy when the robot interacted with him. The woman watched this lovely scene. For a long time, then quietly said, while you're having fun with the robot, I'll go prepare some snacks. Kyle didn't even turn around. Sounds good. Travis, you pressed the wrong button just now. Let me show you. The man took the remote and began explaining the device's functions to the child. Oh my, they're both still children. In Dorothy's life, holidays rarely occurred, and this New Year's night became a true miracle. But above all, she was amazed by Kyle's words. I always dreamed of celebrating Christmas with family. Dorothy looked at the guest with surprise. Don't you have any family? I do, but I cut off all ties with them. They were heavy drinkers, and I had to spend two years in an orphanage. 
that's why I'm strongly against strong alcoholic beverages. And where are they now? I mean your parents. I have no idea. They had their parental rights revoked, and I always dreamed that one day my mom would come and take me home. I was delusional, but no one ever came. Only later, a distant relative who was in the military took me in. That's when I first experienced a real new year. And where is your relative now? He died in service, but he managed to provide for his children and me. I'm very grateful to that person, and I dream of having a close-knit family too. I also dream about it all the time, even though everything seems fine for me. But my dad has a difficult personality. He didn't even want to let me go to college, thinking that I would get into some wild trouble on the very first day. I feel so good with you, Dorothy, and I would like this magical evening to have a continuation. I really want that too, but let's not rush. Let time sort everything out. Okay, I'll respect your decision. Closer to spring, Kyle came back to Newport. Travis greeted him as his best friend. The boy chattered incessantly, trying to get the guest's attention. When the adults started talking, he would get upset. Kyle noticed the child's behavior. He's already starting to show his character. It must be challenging for you. Not entirely. He misbehaves in front of people, but when we're alone, he behaves quietly. Of course, a child gets bored alone. It would be much more fun for him in the company of equally curious little ones. But unfortunately, there's nothing we can do. We don't have another place to live. Once I save up for a car, then we can visit others. Kyle asked cautiously, Dorothy, wouldn't you like to move to the city? The woman smirked bitterly. I've already left that stage behind, and it left me with not-so-pleasant memories. I understand you, but there are more opportunities in the city. And here I'm ready to argue with you. You can live anywhere, that's not the important part. The main thing is what you're focused on. You know, I found a lot of interesting things on the internet. Now that's interesting. And what does the Honey Queen dream of? By the way, thanks to your nickname, everyone now calls me that in the city, even though I'm not the only beekeeper. I have grand plans. I have an idea, but I don't want to reveal it just yet. Are you superstitious? You guessed it. But I can lift the veil of mystery a little. I want to create unusual things, or, more accurately, products. Right now, I'm gathering valuable information, but I think I'll be able to start working in that direction come spring. Dorothy really wanted to tell Kyle about her idea, but she was genuinely afraid of scaring away the dream. She had decided to make cosmetics based on beekeeping products, but she needed to acquire special equipment to bring this plan to life. And that would require a significant amount of money. Well, she couldn't and didn't want to ask Kyle, even though she knew he wouldn't refuse her financial support. Before leaving, the young man asked, Dima and I really enjoyed last year's vacation. If you don't mind, I wouldn't mind resting here again. Kyle, you didn't even have to ask. You're my best friend. Just a friend? Wouldn't you want something more? Dorothy knew that one day she would have to answer this question, but her thoughts were jumbled, and she responded vaguely, Kyle, we agreed not to rush things. But we're adults, and we understand perfectly well that this kind of uncertainty can't go on forever. You're right. But how do you imagine life when you're in the city, and I'm here? Well, for example, like this. If you don't want to leave your town, then I can move here. What about your job? Kyle laughed. With your help, I can retrain as a beekeeper. Of course, it's a joke, but many people work remotely today. That's an option. I'll think about it. Please, think quickly. I'll do my best. They agreed to resolve this major issue in the summer when Kyle would come for vacation. Several days after his departure, Dorothy couldn't focus on her tasks. Travis, who demanded more and more attention, was distracting her. Finally, she picked a day to consult with the deputy. Mrs. Edwards greeted the visitor coldly. What is it that you, Mrs. King, are stirring up in our town? The young woman was taken aback. Could you please explain what I've done this time? 
fine, I won't delve into the details of your personal life anymore. Although the entire district is talking about how you snatched a husband from another family and are dating a lover right in front of your child. That's your private life, but another problem has arisen here. Allow me to ask, how do you make a living? Why are you asking? Because you don't work, yet you afford to buy expensive things. They say you're planning to buy a car. So what? Don't I have the right to buy a car? You do, but where are the funds coming from? You don't work, even though your son turned three a long time ago. My parents and aunt help me. And why should I report to you? If you don't want to tell me about the source of your income, I'll have to report it to the prosecutor. Laws must be upheld. If you're engaged in entrepreneurship, everything should be properly registered. The woman wearily ran her hand over her face. Understand, I have nothing against you, and I perfectly understand how difficult it is for you to live alone, but you've become the main subject of gossip. Sometimes our elderly fantasizers will tell you things that you can't believe. It's a good thing they've gotten used to alerting me. But what if they report it to the police? Mrs. Edwards, honestly, I didn't know that I had to register the five beehives I have. In principle, that's why I came to seek advice from you. The official listened attentively to the young mother and was impressed by her plan. It's an original idea. I haven't even heard of such an innovation. But you understand, Mrs. King, that to obtain permission, you'll have to gather a bunch of documents. I understand, but there's no other way. Let's make a deal then. You collect all the paperwork, and I'll help expedite your case. It's in our interest to give your business the green light. Moreover, you're a young mother and have taken on such a worthwhile endeavor. Women will be thrilled, and such a product will definitely be in high demand. For a trial, Dorothy decided to make a few jars of moisturizing honey cream and a few lip gloss tubes. She took these samples to the laboratory for testing and then showed them to Mrs. Edwards along with the report. The official was surprised. You're so quick, and your documents are still under review. But I'm confident that there will be a positive decision. The higher-ups are very interested. Moreover, the district authorities have decided to gain some publicity from this. Meaning? Your naivety amazes me. It's all for improving their image, and for that, they can be a little generous. Mrs. Edwards looked around and, making sure no one was around, whispered, they've decided to make it a grand event, with journalists and representatives from various organizations. In short, it's a somewhat staged event, but it's only to your benefit. I assure you that your unique cosmetics will be a hit. And there will also be gifts from sponsors, very useful devices. I've seen the project, so get ready. Thank you, Mrs. Edwards. Dorothy, and be careful with your neighbors there. We don't need any extra rumors. Okay, I'll work on it. Dorothy was filled with various emotions. On one hand, there were rumors, and on the other hand, there was real help. The young woman hadn't fully grasped how one could live in a world of such contradictions. In the evening, she informed Kyle about her first victory. You know, Kyle, I've been living here for over two years, but I still can't get used to the peculiar way of life. Perhaps that's the beauty of it. Do you remember our last conversation? Yes, Kyle. I even made a decision. Say the word I've been waiting for so long. Come if you haven't changed your mind. I'm not used to changing my decisions. I'll come by the end of this month. Only after Dorothy hung up did she realize that everything had changed. Her life was taking a new turn. She hoped that this turn would be happier than all the others. Two days later, Mrs. Edwards visited her, and judging by her face, she had good news. Come in, Mrs. Edwards. I can tell you didn't come here for no reason. You're absolutely right, Mrs. King. A celebration and your presentation are scheduled in two weeks. Tell me, do you have enough time to prepare? Dorothy pondered. She was currently preparing a hand cream, not just any cream, but one that could, to some extent, restore youth to the skin of the hands. If she worked diligently for a couple of days and then sent the cream for testing, she would be able to present a few of her products. 
Overall, Dorothy had grand plans, all of which revolved around money. She didn't have enough money yet to purchase all the necessary equipment, but she knew she would acquire it regardless. So to speak, Dorothy's transition to becoming a sole proprietor went splendidly. Granted, she was given only half an hour, while the officials were occupied with completely different matters for the rest of the time. But that turned out to be sufficient. Following Mrs. Edwards' suggestion, Dorothy presented her cream as a gift to the wives of the most influential individuals and hoped they would like it. The first echo came just a week later. Dorothy heard a car stop near her house. It was strange that the townsfolk overlooked her. Usually, they would form two rows and greet anyone passing by, but this time there was no one. Either they had become accustomed to the constant stream of visitors to her place or something else was going on. A beautiful woman in her mid-forties stepped out of the car and walked towards the entrance. Dorothy hurried to meet her. Mrs. King, hello. Yes, that's me. The woman scrutinized her carefully. I pictured you differently. I'm sorry, may I ask who I have the pleasure of speaking with? The woman smiled. Apologies, my name is Miss Coleman. I have my own cosmetics store, and I have a business proposal for you. Dorothy even felt a slight irritation within herself. Please, come inside. The woman looked around. You have a very cozy place. I must admit, I haven't been in such an environment for a long time, and you know, it doesn't seem old-fashioned. It seems very natural and suitable for this area. I like it too, although at first, I felt like I had entered a different world. Tea or coffee? I'll have some tea, please. Ten minutes later, they were sitting across from each other. As I mentioned before, I have a large and not-so-cheap cosmetics store. My clients are very wealthy ladies. Not long ago, one of my clients boasted about your cream to me and even shared a little. To say that I was thrilled is an understatement. I would like to offer you a niche in my store. It means recognition for you and, of course, money. I don't think such a cream can be priced cheaply. Besides, until you are, so to speak, established enough to open your own store, I think it's impractical. But this way, both you and I benefit. The store adds a markup, and by promoting you, we promote ourselves. I've been in this business for a long time, and I know very well that some cosmetics, no matter how superior they seem, just don't sell, no matter how much you advertise them. And some, which you initially overlook, instantly take off. If we sign a contract, I suggest starting with a six-month trial period, if you don't mind. But I tried your cream. I only use French cosmetics, and I don't know why, but I decided to give it a try. A pause lingered. Dorothy couldn't hold back. And, how was it? Well, you understand, I wouldn't have come here otherwise. I never ask for anything. But now, overall, I'm convinced that we can have a very fruitful collaboration. Here, take a look, and then give me a call with your decision. The woman headed towards the door but turned back. Here's my advice. Don't spread yourself too thin. You make 10 jars per month, so let it be 10, and the price will speak for itself. That night, Dorothy slept poorly. Her small success seemed to want to exceed her expectations. She questioned herself if she was ready for this, and only in the morning did she answer, yes. Two months passed. Dorothy, if you only knew how I feel right now. It seems like nothing interesting happened before. Everything started here, next to you. You know, Kyle, I have the same feeling. And overall, I try. To forget everything that happened before. I just feel sorry for Mrs. Green. She was a wonderful person. When should we call your parents? Dorothy smiled. I think a little later. Let's register first and then call. Don't you want a wedding? No, it's not necessary. Dorothy had hoped that she and Kyle would quietly get married, but she completely overlooked the fact that this was a town. And if people knew that a car would arrive 10 minutes before its appearance, such an event couldn't be kept a secret. About two weeks before the registration, Mrs. Miller came to their house. Hello, Dorothy. Hello, Kyle. 
Dorothy laughed. Oh, you're very formal today, Mrs. Miller. Well, I came to apologize. Dorothy became suspicious, noticing that her neighbor was speaking in riddles. Apologize for what? I don't understand. Kyle looked at Barbara with interest. He already knew her character, and overall, she was a harmless person. But you should know why. Apparently, I offended you somehow, as I hear from strangers that you're getting married. Dorothy sighed. That's it. Here we go. Mrs. Miller, there won't be any wedding. We're just going to register, that's all. The old lady looked at her, not understanding. Do you not have money or something? Well, yes, why? We don't want to celebrate. What do you mean, you don't want to? It's a celebration, no matter how you look at it. Dorothy and Barbara tried to argue with each other. Finally, Dorothy got tired, and Barbara said, don't hope that it will be that simple. People will still come to congratulate you, and you don't even have a table set. The neighbor left, and Kyle looked at Dorothy cheerfully. So, what do you say? Shall we call your parents and hurry to the city to buy a wedding dress? Dorothy just sighed. Surprisingly, the wedding turned out to be quite joyful. The townspeople brought accordions and balalaikas with them. Soon, modern music was pushed aside, and all the guests happily danced to folk songs, often performed by Barbara. The main dancer, of course, was Travis. Ernest danced skillfully next to him, while mom and dad, along with Mrs. Martinez and her husband, supported them. This time, mom and dad were very pleased. Dad, of course, initially kept an eye on. Kyle due to his character, but after a few hours, he smiled and said he was now at ease with his daughter's choice. Mom also liked Kyle, and she was even more pleased with how Kyle treated Travis. The boy often approached Kyle more than his own mother. Kyle never once said he was too busy. The next day, during lunch, Dorothy's father asked, so, how are things with the honey, with the bees? You never told us if everything worked out. Dorothy smiled. Well, I think so. At that moment, her mother chimed in. You know, Dorothy, I got this cream through an acquaintance. You can't imagine how amazing it is. Better tell me how much it costs. Her father rolled his eyes. Stop it, what difference does it make? Beauty doesn't come cheap. So, this woman told me that it's handmade cream, and it's made with bee products. They also say that the girl who makes it is very young, and they call her the Honey Queen. I thought since you're venturing into something unfamiliar and succeeding, maybe you should give it a try. Mr. Anderson nudged his wife gently. What are you saying? Do you think it's that easy? That girl probably studied specifically for this. But our Dorothy, where would she study for this? Dorothy looked at Kyle, and he looked at her. She simply didn't know what to do, but then she turned and calmly said, Mom, the Honey Queen is me. And the creams are mine too. Her mother and father stared at her as if she had gone crazy. Dorothy stood up, went into the room she had set up for work, and brought out the cream, lipstick, and her other jars. Here, Mom, this is cream for you as a reserve, this is the lipstick. And this one, no one else has it yet. It will be available for sale in a week. Mrs. Anderson took a while to regain her composure. She didn't expect this, and certainly not Mr. Anderson. As they were leaving, her father said, You know, Dorothy, I was certain that if you didn't listen to me, your whole life would go awry. But now I think I was wrong to meddle with my advice. You manage much better without them. And Dorothy did something she hadn't done in a long time. She hugged her father and said, Dad, who knows where I would be if I hadn't listened to you sometimes. Come visit us sometime, not just for two days, but for a longer stay. Kyle and I have decided to have a real big renovation. Well, so that our palace can be seen from afar. The father looked around the huge house, and the mother said, Dorothy, it will cost a fortune to fix this place. Dorothy smiled. Well, firstly, I have a husband who earns a decent income, and secondly, mom, you've seen how much my products sell for. And there's also honey, and it's completely different. The father coughed. 
Kyle, if you need any help, don't hesitate to ask. We can help with money and even do something ourselves. Okay, Mr. Anderson, for sure. Ernest also promised to drop by during his vacation. Together, we'll handle it quickly. You're planning to do everything yourself? Mostly, yes. I want it to be a labor of love. But I'll hire a crew for the roof, I've already found them. As soon as Alia and I decide on the type of roof, they'll come right away. It took several years for us to truly get our hands on the house. They did a bit of roof repair, but then they couldn't focus on it. Dorothy got pregnant and couldn't work at full capacity. Kyle, after some reflection, decided to help his wife. Time flies unnoticed, and Kyle and Dorothy's daughter is almost four years old, while Travis is about to start school soon. The cosmetics sold very well, and there was always a high demand for them. More and more people wanted to have this miracle product made in genuine natural conditions from real natural ingredients. Finally, Kyle gave the command, they couldn't delay any longer. After all this time, the house hadn't let them down, so now it was time for a major renovation. Dorothy looked around and realized that she had gotten used to it and didn't notice the contrast. The house looked neglected and old, despite its size, with all the new constructions and even a small fountain in the yard. It so happened that Miss Coleman visited Dorothy. She sadly explained that she wouldn't want to let Dorothy go, but her international partners were interested in her. Dorothy, they have gone crazy over natural products. Anyway, they are willing to come, willing. To provide you with all the necessary equipment, just so you don't refuse them. Coincidentally, at the same time, a large foreign car arrived at the house, and the workers arrived as well. The first crew came for the roof, and the next day, the ones responsible for the foundation and the house were scheduled to arrive. Dorothy led the foreigners into the house, while Kyle dealt with the workers. One of the workers said, I never thought I would be fixing the roof for such a celebrity. And I never thought people like you could live in this town. Stephen hardly listened to him. Yesterday, the police finally caught him. He had changed cities three times, but they always managed to find him somehow. I wonder if it's because of the SIM card. Ah. Uh. I messed up everything. If I had met with them right away, maybe I would be free now. But instead, the apartment is sealed, the debts are piling up, and I'm on the run. Yesterday, they seriously told him that he had three months before prison. He didn't want to go to prison. Jen, are you even listening to me? I'm listening. What kind of celebrity? What kind of artist? No. The Honey Queen. Stephen strained his brain. Yes, recently he had heard that phrase often. It seemed to be related to some expensive cosmetics. Well, people are lucky. If only he could settle his debts like that, he sighed. I wonder if they'll feed them. He drank his last bit of money yesterday out of despair. Today, he couldn't even afford kefir. It's embarrassing to borrow from his partner. He heard the door open in the house, and foreigners entered the yard. They were happily talking in their language, and then the owner came out. Travis, where are you? A boy came out of the shed. Where's Charlotte? She's here, nowhere. She's sleeping in the shed. You know she likes sleeping there. Stephen staggered. No way. It couldn't be. His partner looked at him strangely. Jen, what's wrong? What's wrong? You said the honey queen. He waited until the foreigners left and quickly went downstairs. The homeowner had left earlier, saying he went to the hardware store. The woman stood with her back to him. But the boy was looking at him. Yes, there was no doubt. It was Travis. Well, hello, Dorothy. So this is how it is. You left me to perish, gave me away like a pack of wolves, while you live a life of luxury. She turned sharply. Stephen was stunned. His ex-wife seemed to have gotten younger, more beautiful. Stephen, what are you doing here? That's what I would like to know, what am I doing here? You abandoned me in such a difficult moment. As my wife, you should have helped me. Don't talk nonsense. 
You didn't even show up at your mother's funeral. And we ended up on the streets with little Travis. I don't need such a worker in my house, so you can leave. Dorothy took Travis by the hand and headed towards the shed that Travis and Kyle had turned into a workshop. At almost seven years old, the boy knew how to handle a jigsaw, a power drill, and other tools, and his dad Kyle had taught him to navigate a computer with his eyes closed. Stephen was stunned. It turns out his wife still had a voice. Well, it didn't matter, he would set things right now. Stephen had completely forgotten that Dorothy was no longer his wife. Right now, he was only thinking about one thing. She was responsible for everything, so she should pay. Dorothy. She turned around. We didn't agree on anything. You have to give me money, a lot of money. Otherwise, I'll take my son away. Travis hid behind his mother but then stepped forward and stood in front of her. I'm not going anywhere with you, and don't you dare shout at my mom. Dorothy was bewildered. She simply didn't know what to do. Jen's partner stood frozen on the roof, like a statue. He had no understanding of what was happening. Stephen, I don't owe you anything. If anything, it's the other way around. The other way around? It's thanks to your grace that I'm practically homeless. Stephen, you accumulated debts yourself. Please leave my house. Stephen smiled, took a sharp step forward, and grabbed Travis. Don't come any closer, or I'll break his neck. Do you hear me? Give me the money. He knew he was doing something terrible, but he couldn't stop himself. There was no turning back. And it brought him great pleasure to see the fear in his ex-wife's eyes. Stephen, please, I'll give you everything, everything. Well, then hurry up. He had barely finished speaking when he let go of Travis and collapsed onto the ground himself. His partner stood behind him. He looked at the board in his hands, then threw it aside and turned to Dorothy. I'm sorry. She scooped Travis into her arms and moved away. Take Charlotte and go home. Lock yourself in and don't open the door. But mom, what about you? The gate creaked. What's going on here? Kyle scanned the yard, and Dorothy let out a sigh of relief. Stephen was given a long prison sentence. There were many charges against him, but Dorothy didn't attend the trial. Kyle went instead. She couldn't go. Firstly, she had a student, the young wife of Ernest, who had bought a house nearby. And secondly, Dorothy was expecting another child. When Kyle found out, he couldn't contain his excitement. Now I'll have a truly big and strong family, although I already have one. With your arrival, a family was born. I love you very much, very much. Dorothy knew for certain that she was the happiest woman in the world.